venerable gestures, sought to restrain the blacks, who, at the sight of three gurried water casks in its bottom, and a pile of wilted pumpkins in its bow, hung over the bulwarks in disorderly raptured. Don Benito, with his servant, now appeared. His coming perhaps hastened by hearing the noise. Of him, Captain Delano sought permission to serve out the water so that all might share alike, and none injure themselves by unfair excess. But, sensible and, on Don Benito's account, kind as this offer was, it was received with what seemed impatience, as if aware that he lacked energy as a commander. Don Benito, with a true jealousy of weakness, resented as any affront any interference. So at least, Captain Delano inferred. In another moment, the casks were being hoisted in, when some of the eager negroes accidentally jostled Captain Delano where he stood by the gangway, so that, unmindful of Don Benito, yielding to the impulse of the moment with good-natured authority, he bade the black stand back to enforce his words, making use of a half-mirthful, half-menacing gesture. Instantly the blacks paused, just where they were, each negro and negress suspended in his or her posture, exactly as the word had found them, for a few seconds continuing so, while, as between the responsive posts of a telegraph, an unknown syllable ran from man to man among the perched oakum pickers. While the visitor's attention was fixed by this scene, suddenly the hatchet polishers half rose, and a rapid cry came from Don Benito. Thinking that at the signal of the Spaniard he was about to be massacred, Captain Delano would have sprung for his boat, but paused as the oakum pickers, dropping down into the crowd with earnest exclamations, forced every white and every negro back at the same moment with gestures friendly and familiar, almost jocose, bidding him, in substance, not to be a fool. Simultaneously, the hatchet polishers resumed their seats, quietly as so many tailors, and at once, as if nothing had happened, the work of hoisting in the casks was resumed, whites and blacks singing at the tackle. Captain Delano glanced towards Don Benito, as he saw his meagre form in the act of recovering itself from reclining in the servant's arms, into which the agitated invalid had fallen, he could not but marvel at the panic by which himself had been surprised. On the darting supposition that such a commander who, upon a legitimate occasion so trivial too, as it now appeared, could lose all self-command, was, with energetic iniquity, going to bring about his murder. The casks being on deck, Captain Delano was handed a number of jars and cups by one of the steward's aides, who, in the name of his captain, entreated him to do as he had proposed, dole out the water. He complied with republican impartiality as to this republican element, which always seeks one level, serving the oldest white no better than the youngest black, excepting, indeed, poor Don Benito, whose condition, if not rank, demanded an extra allowance. To him, into the fair pitcher of the fluid, but thirsting as he was for it, the Spaniard quaffed not a drop until after several grave bows and salutes. A reciprocation of courtesies, which the sight-loving Africans held with clapping of hands, two of the less wilted pumpkins being reserved for the cabin table, the residue were minced up on the spot for the general regalment. But the soft bread, sugar and bottled cider, Captain Delano would have given the whites alone and in chief Don Benito, but the latter objected, which disinterestedness not a little pleased the American. And so mouthfuls all around were given alike to whites and blacks, excepting one bottle of cider, which Babo insisted 
on setting aside for his master. Here it may be observed that, as on the first visit of the boat, the American had not permitted his men to board the ship. Neither did he now, being unwilling to add to the confusion of the decks. Not uninfluenced by the peculiar good humour of present prevailing, and from the time oblivious of any but benevolent thoughts, Captain Delano, who, from recent indications, counted upon a breeze within an hour or two at furthest, dispatched the boat back to the sealer with orders for all the hands that could be spared immediately to set about the rafting casks to the water place and filling them. Likewise, he bade word be carried to the chief officer that, if against present expectation the ship was not brought to anchor by sunset, he need be under no concern, for as there was to be a full moon that night, he, Captain Delano, would remain on board, ready to play the pilot, come the wind soon or late. As the two captains stood together, observing the departing boat, the servant, as it happened, having just spied a spot on his master's velvet sleeve and silently engaged rubbing it out, the American expressed his regrets that the San Dominic had no boats, none at least but the unseaworthy old hulk of the long boat, which, warped as a camel skeleton in the desert and almost as bleached, lay potwise inverted amidships, one side a little tipped, furnishing a subterraneous sort of den for family groups of the blacks, mostly women and small children, who squatted on old mats below or perched above in the dark dome on the elevated seats were descried some distance within like a social circle of bats sheltering in some friendly cave at intervals ebon flights of naked boys and girls three or four years old darting in and out of the den's mouth had you three or four boats now don benito said captain delano i think that by tugging at the oars, your negroes here might help along matters some. Did you sail from port without boats, Don Benito? They were stove in the gales, signor. That was bad. Many men too, you lost them. Boats and men. Those must have been hard gales, Don Benito. Past all speech, cringed the Spaniard. Tell me, Don Benito continued his companion with increased interest. Tell me, were these gals immediately off the pitch of Cape Horn? Cape Horn? Who spoke of Cape Horn? Yourself did, when giving me an account of your voyage, answered Captain Delano, with almost equal astonishment at his eating of his own words, even as he ever seemed eating his own heart, on the part of the Spaniard. You yourself, Don Benito, spoke of Cape Horn, he emphatically repeated. The Spaniard turned in a sort of stooping posture, pausing an instant as one about to make a plunging exchange of elements, as from air to water. At this moment, a messenger boy, a white, hurried by in the regular performance of his function, carrying the last expired half hour forward to the forecastle from the cabin timepiece to have it struck at the large ship's bell. Master, said the servant, discontinuing his work on the coat sleeve and addressing the rapt Spaniard with a sort of timid apprehensiveness as one charged with a duty, the discharge of which, it was foreseen, would prove irksome to the very person who had imposed it and for the benefit it was intended. Master told me never mind where he was or how engaged, always to remind him to a minute when shaving time comes. Miguel has gone to strike the half hour afternoon. It is now, master. Will master go into the cuddy? Ah, yes, answered the Spaniard, starting as from dreams into realities. Then turning upon Captain Delano, he said that ere long he would resume the conversation. Then, if Master means to talk more to Don Amasa, said the servant, why not let Don Amasa sit by Master in the cuddy, 
and Master can talk, and Donna Massa can listen, while Babu here lathers and strops. Yes, said Captain Delano, not unpleased with this sociable plan. Yes, Don Benito, unless you had rather not, I will go with you. Be it so, senor. As the three passed aft, the American could not but think it another strange instance of his hosting capriciousness that this being shaved with such uncommon punctuality in the middle of the day but he deemed it more than likely that the servant's anxious fidelity had something to do with the matter, inasmuch as the timely interruption served to rally his master from the mood which had evidently been coming upon him. The place, called the Cuddy, was a light deck cabin formed by the poop, a sort of attic to the large cabin below. Part of it had formerly been the quarters of the officers, but since their death, all the partitioning had been thrown down and the whole interior converted into one spacious and airy marine hall for absence of fine furniture and picturesque disarray of old appurtenances, somewhat answering to the wide, cluttered hall of some eccentric bachelor squire in the country who hang his shooting jacket and tobacco pouch on deer antlers, and keeps his fishing rod, tongs, and walking stick in the same corner. The similitude was heightened, if not originally suggested, by glimpses of the surrounding sea, since, in one aspect, the country and the ocean seem cousins German. The floor of the cuddy was matted. Overhead, four or five old muskets were struck into horizontal holes along the beams. On one side was a claw-footed old table lashed to the deck, a thumbed missile on it, and over it a small, meagre crucifix attached to the bulkhead. Under the table lay a dented cutlass or two, with a hacked harpoon among some melancholy old rigging like a heap of poor friar's girdles. There were also two long, sharp-ribbed settees of malacca cane, black with age and uncomfortable to look at as inquisitor's racks with a large, misshapen armchair, which, furnished with a rude barber's crotch at the back, working with a screw, seemed some grotesque engine of torment. A flag locker was in one corner, open, exposing various coloured bunting, some rolled up, others half unrolled, still others tumbled. Opposite was a cumbrous washstand of black mahogany, all of one block, with a pedestal like a font, and over it a rallied shelf containing combs, brushes and other implements. A torn hammock of stained grass swung near, the sheets tossed, and the pillow wrinkled up like a brow, as if whoever slept here slept but illy with alternate visitations of sad thoughts and bad dreams. The further extremity of the cuddy, overhanging the ship's stern, was pierced with three openings, windows and portholes, according as men or cannon might peer, socially or unsocially, out of them. At present, neither men nor cannon were seen, though huge ring bolts and other rusty iron fixtures of the woodwork hinted of twenty-four pounders. Glancing toward the hammock as he entered, Captain Delano said, You sleep here, Don Benito? Yes, senor, since we got into mild weather. This seems a sort of dormitory sitting room, cell loft, chapel, and private closet altogether, Don Benito added Captain Delano, looking around. Yes, senor, events have not been favourable to much order in arrangements. Here the servant, napkin on arm, made a motion as if waiting his master's good pleasure. Don Benito signified his readiness when, seating him in the Malacca armchair, and for the guest's convenience drawing opposite one of the settees, the servant commenced operations by throwing back his master's collar and loosening his cravat. 
There is something in the Negro which, in a peculiar way, fits him for avocations about one's person. Most Negroes are natural valets and hairdressers, taking the comb and brush congenially as to the castanets and flourishing them apparently with almost equal satisfaction. There is, too, a smooth tact about them in this employment, with a marvellous, noiseless, gliding briskness not ungraceful in its way, singularly pleasing to behold, and still more so, to be the manipulated subject of. And above all is the great gift of good humour, not the mere grin or laugh is here meant. Those were unsuitable. But a certain easy cheerfulness, harmonious in every glance and gesture, as though God had set the whole negro to some pleasant tune. When to this is added, the docility, arising from the unaspiring contentment of a limited mind and that susceptibility of blind attachment, sometimes in hearing in indisputable inferiors, one readily perceives why these hypochondriacs, Johnson and Byron, it may be, something like the hypochondriac Benito Serino, took to their hearts, almost to the exclusion of the entire white race, their serving men, the Negroes, Barber and Fletcher. But if there be that in the Negro which exempts him from the inflicted sourness of the morbid and cynical mind, how in his most prepossessing aspects must he appear to a benevolent one? When at ease with respect to exterior things, Captain Delano's nature was not only benign, but familiarly and humorously so. At home, he had often taken rare satisfaction in sitting in his door, watching some free man of colour at his work or play. If on a voyage he chanced to have a black sailor, invariably he was on chatty and half-gamesome terms with him. In fact, like most men of a good, blithe heart, Captain Delano took to Negroes, not philanthropically, but genially, just as other men, to Newfoundland dogs. Hitherto, the circumstances in which he found the San Dominic had repressed the tendency. But in the Cuddy, relieved from his former uneasiness and, for various reasons, more sociably inclined than at any previous period of the day, and seeing the coloured servant, napkin on arm, so debonair about his master, in a business so familiar as that of shaving too, all his old weakness from Negroes returned. Among other things, he was amused with an odd instance of the African love of bright colours and fine shows, in the blacks informally taking from the flag locker a great piece of bunting of all hues and lavishly tucking it under the master's chin for an apron. The mode of shaving among the Spaniards is a little different from what is with other nations. They have a basin, specifically called a barber's basin, which on one side is scooped out so as accurately to receive the chin, against which it is closely held in lathering, which is done not with a brush, but with soap dipped in the water of the basin and rubbed on the face. In the present instance, salt water was used for lack of better and the parts lathered were only the upper lip and low down under the throat, all the rest being cultivated beard. The preliminaries being somewhat novel to Captain Delano, he sat curiously eyeing them so that no conversation took place, nor for the present did Don Benito appear disposed to renew any. Setting down his basin, the negro searched among the razors as for the sharpest and having found it, gave it an additional edge by expertly strapping it on the firm, smooth, oily skin of his open palm. He then made a gesture as if to begin, but midway stood suspended for an instant, one hand elevating the razor, the other professionally dabbling among the bubbling suds of the Spaniard's lank neck. Not unaffected by the close sight 
of the gleaming steel. Don Benito nervously shuddered. His usual ghastliness was heightened by the lather, which lather again was intensified in its hue by the contrasting sootiness of the negro's body. Altogether, the scene was somewhat peculiar, at least to Captain Delano, nor, as he saw the two thus postured, could he resist the vagary that in the black he saw a headsman, and in the white a man at the block. But this was one of those antic conceits, appearing and vanishing in a breath, from which perhaps the best-regulated mind is not always free. Meantime, the agitation of the Spaniard had a little loosened the bunting from around him, so that one broad fold swept curtain-like over, the chair arm to the floor, revealing, amid a profusion of armorial bars and ground colours, black, blue and yellow, a closed castle in a red blood field, diagonal with a lion rampart in white. The castle and the lion, exclaimed Captain Delano. Why, Don Benito, this is a flag of Spain you use here. It's well it's only I, and not the king, that sees this, he added with a smile, but turning towards the black. It's all one, I suppose, so the colours be gay, which playful remark did not fail somewhat to tickle the negro. Now, master, he said, readjusting the flag and pressing the head gently further back to the crotch of the chair. Now, master, and the steel glanced nigh the throat. Again Don Benito faintly shuddered. You must not shake so, master. See, Donna Massa, Massa always shakes when I shave him, and yet master knows I never yet have drawn blood. Though it's true, if master will shake so, I may some of these times. Now, master, he continued, and now, Donna Massa, please go on with your talk about the gale, and all that. Master can hear, and between times, Massa can answer. Ah, yes, these gales, said Captain Delano. But the more I think of your voyage, Don Benito, the more I wonder not at the gales, terrible as they must have been, but at the disastrous interval following them. From here, by your account, have you been these two months and more getting from Cape Horn to St. Maria, a distance which I myself, with a good wind, have sailed in a few days? True, you had calms and long ones, but to be becalmed for two months, that is at least unusual. Why, Don Benito had almost any other gentleman told me such a story, I should have been half disposed to a little incredulity. Here, an involuntary expression came over the Spaniard, similar to that just before on the deck, and whether it was the start he gave, or a sudden gawky roll of the hull in the calm, or a momentary unsteadiness of the servant's hand, however it was, just then the razor drew blood, spots of which stained the creamy lather under the throat. Immediately the black barber drew his steel and, remaining in his professional attitude, back to Captain Delano and face to Don Benito, held up the trickling razor, saying with a sort of half-humorous sorrow, See, Massa, you shook so. Here's Babo's first blood. No sword drawn before James I of England, no assassination in that timid king's presence, could have produced a more terrified aspect than was now presented by Don Benito. Poor fellow, thought Captain Delano, so nervous he can't even bear the sight of Barber's blood. And this unstrung, sick man, is it credible that I should have imagined he meant to spill all my blood? Who can't endure the sight of one little drop of his own? Surely, Amasa Delano, you must have been beside yourself this day. Tell it not when you get home, Sapia Massa. Well, well, he looks like a murderer, doesn't he? More like as he himself were to be done for. Well, well, this day's experience shall be a good lesson. Meantime, while these things were running through the honest seaman's mind, 
The servant had taken the napkin from his arm, and to Don Benito had said, But answer, Don Amasa, please, master, while I wipe this ugly stuff off the razor and strap it again. As he said the words, his face was turned half round so as to be alike visible to the Spaniard and the American, and seemed, by its expression, to hint that it was desirous, by getting his master to go on with the conversation, considerately to withdraw his attention from the recent annoying accident, as if glad to snatch the ordered relief. Don Benito resumed, rehearsing to Captain Delano, that not only were the calms of unusual duration, but the ship had fallen in with obstinate currents and other things he added, some of which were but repetitions of former statements, to explain how it came to pass that that the passage from Cape Horn to St. Maria had been so exceedingly long, now and then mingling with his words, incidental praises, less qualified than before to the blacks for their general good conduct. These particulars were not given consecutively, the servant at convenient times using his razor, and so, between the intervals of shaving, the story and panegyric went on with more than usual huskiness. To Captain Delano's imagination, Now again, not wholly at rest, there was something so hollow in the Spaniard's manner, with apparently some reciprocal hollowness in the servant's dusky comment of silence, that the idea flashed across him that possibly master and man, for some unknown purpose, were acting out both in word and deed, nay, to the very tremor of Don Benito's limbs, some juggling play before him. Neither did the suspicion of collusion lack apparent support from the facts of those whispered conferences before mentioned. But then, what could be the object of enacting this play of the barber before him? At last, regarding the notion as a whimsy, insensibly suggested perhaps, by the theatrical aspect of Don Benito in his Harlequin ensign, Captain Delano speedily banished it. The shaving over, The servant bestirred himself with a small bottle of scented waters, pouring a few drops on the head and then diligently rubbing the vehemence of the exercise, causing the muscles of his face to twitch rather strangely. The next operation was with comb, scissors and brush, going round and round, smoothing a curl here, clipping an unruly whisker there, giving a graceful sweep to the temple lock, with other impromptu touches evincing the hand of a master, while, like any resigned gentleman in barber's hands, Don Benito bore all, much less uneasily, at least, than he had done the razoring. Indeed, he sat so pale and rigid now that the negro seemed a Nubian sculptor finishing off a white statue head. Being over at last, the standard of Spain removed, tumbled up and tossed back into the flag locker, the negro's warm breath blowing away any stray hair which might have lodged down the master's neck, collar and cravat readjusted, and speck of lint whisked off the velvet lapel. All this being done, backing off a little space and pausing with an expression of subdued self-complacency, the servant for a moment surveyed his master as in toilette, at least, the creature of his own tasteful hands. Captain Delano playfully complimented him upon his achievement, at the same time congratulating Don Benito. But neither sweet waters nor shampooing, nor fidelity nor sociality delighted the Spaniard. Seeing him relapsing into forbidding gloom and still remaining seated, Captain Delano, thinking that his presence was undesired just then, withdrew on pretense of seeing whether, as he had prophesied, any signs of a breeze were visible. Walking forward to the main mast, he stood a while, thinking over the scene, and not without some undefined misgivings, when he heard a noise near the cuddy, and turning, saw the negro, his hand to his cheek. Advancing, Captain Delano perceived that the cheek was bleeding, 
He was about to ask the cause when the Negro's wailing soliloquy enlightened him. Ah, when will Massa get better from his sickness? Only the sour heart that sour sickness breeds made him serve Babo so, cutting Babo with the razor, because only by accident Babo had given Master one little scratch, and for the first time in so many a day too. Ah, holding his hand to his face. Is it possible, thought Captain Delano, was it to wreak in private his Spanish spite against this poor friend of his, that Don Benito, by his sullen manner, impelled me to withdraw? Ah, this slavery breeds ugly passions in man. Poor fellow. He was about to speak in sympathy to the Negro, but with a timid reluctance, he now re-entered the cuddy. Presently, master and man came forth, Don Benito leaning on his servant as if nothing had happened. But a sort of love quarrel, after all, thought Captain Delano. He accosted Don Benito, and they slowly walked together. They had gone but a few paces when the steward, a tall, raja-looking mulatto, orientally set off with a pagoda turban, formed by three or four madras handkerchiefs, wound about his head, tier on tier, approaching with a salam, announced lunch to the cabin. On their way thither, the two captains were preceded by the mulatto who, turning round as he advanced, with continual smiles and bows, ushered them on a display of elegance which quite completed the insignificance of the small, bare-headed babu, who, as if not unconscious of inferiority, eyed askance the graceful steward. But in part, Captain Delano imputed his jealous watchfulness to that peculiar feeling which the full-blooded African entertains for the adulterated one. As for the steward, his manner, if not bespeaking much dignity of self-respect, yet evidenced his extreme desire to please, which is doubly meritorious, as at once Christian and Chesterfieldian. Captain Delano observed with interest that, while the complexion of the mulatto was hybrid, his physiognomy was European, classically so. Don Benito, Don Benito, whispered he, I am glad to see this usher of the golden rod of yours. The sight refutes an ugly remark once made to me by a Barbados planter, that when a mulatto has a regular European face, look out for him. But see, your steward here has features more regular than King George's of England, and yet there he nods and bows and smiles. A king indeed, a king of kind hearts and polite fellows. What a pleasant voice he has too. He has, signor. But tell me, has he not, so far as you have known him, always proved a good, worthy fellow? said Captain Delano, pausing while, with a final genuflection, the steward disappeared into the cabin. Come, for the reason just mentioned, I am curious to know. Francesco is a good man, a sort of sluggishly responded Don Benito, like a phlegmatic appreciator who would neither find fault nor flatter. Ah, I thought so, for it were strange indeed and not very creditable to us whiteskins if a little of our blood mixed with the Africans should, far from improving the latter's quality, have the sad effect of pouring vitriolic acid into black broth perhaps, but not the wholesomeness. Doubtless, doubtless, signor, but, glancing at Babo, not to speak of Negroes, your planter's remark I have heard apply to the Spanish and Indian intermixtures in our provinces. But I know nothing about the matter, he listlessly added. And here they entered the cabin. The lunch was a frugal one. Some of Captain Delano's fresh fish and pumpkins, biscuit and salt beef, the reserved bottle of cider, and the San Dominic's last bottle of canary. As they entered, Francisco, with two or three coloured aids, was hovering over the table, giving last adjustments. Upon perceiving their master, they withdrew, Francesco making a smiling conge, and the Spaniard, without condescending to notice it, fastidiously remarking to his companion that he relished not superfluous attendance. Without companions, host and guest sat down, 
like a childless married couple at opposite ends of the table. Don Benito waving Captain Delano to his place and, weak as he was, insisting upon that gentleman being seated before himself. The Negro placed a rug under Don Benito's feet and a cushion behind his back and then stood behind, not his master's chair, but Captain Delano's. At first, this a little surprised the latter. But it was soon evident that, in taking his position, the black was still true to his master, since by facing him he could the more readily anticipate his slightest want. This is an uncommonly intelligent fellow of yours, Don Benito, whispered Captain Delano across the table. You say true, senor. During the repast, the guest again reverted to parts of Don Benito's story, begging further particulars here and there. He inquired how it was that the scurvy and fever should have committed such wholesale havoc upon the whites while destroying less of half of the blacks. As if this question reproduced the whole scene of plague before the Spaniard's eyes, miserably reminding him of his solitude in a cabin where before he had had so many friends and officers round him, his hand shook, his face became hueless, broken words escaped, but directly the sane memory of the past seemed replaced by insane terrors of the present. With starting eyes, he stared before him at vacancy. For nothing was to be seen but the hand of his servant pushing the canary over towards him. At length, a few sips served partially to restore him. He made random reference to the different constitution of races, enabling one to offer more resistance to certain maladies than another. The thought was new to his companion. Presently, Captain Delano, intending to say something to his host concerning the pecuniary part of the business he had undertaken for him, especially since he was strictly accountable to his owners with reference to the new suit of sails and other things of that sort, and naturally preferring to conduct such affairs in private, was desirous that the servant should withdraw, imagining that Don Benito could dispense with his attendance. He, however, waited a while, thinking that as the conversation proceeded, Don Benito, without being prompted, would perceive the propriety of the step. But it was otherwise. At last, catching his host's eye, Captain Delano, with a slight backward gesture of his thumb, whispered, Don Benito, pardon me, but there is an interference with the full expression of what I have to say to you. Upon this, the Spaniard changed countenance, which was imputed to his resenting the hint, as in some way a reflection upon his servant. After a moment's pause, he assured his guest that the blacks remaining with them could be of no disservice, because since losing his officers, he had made Babu, whose original office it now appeared, had been captain of the slaves, not only his constant attendant and companion, but in all things his confidant. After this, nothing more could be said, though indeed Captain Delano could hardly avoid some little tinge of irritation upon being left ungratified in so inconsiderable a wish by one too for whom he intended such solid services. But it is only his querulousness, thought he, and so filling his glass he proceeded to business. The price of the sales and other matters was fixed upon, but while this was being done, the American observed that, though his original offer of assistance had been hailed with hectic animation, yet now when it was reduced to a business transaction, indifference and apathy were betrayed. Don Benito, in fact, appeared to submit to hearing the details more out of regard to common propriety than from any impression that weighty benefit to himself and his voyage was involved. Soon, his manner became still more reserved. The effort was vain to seek to draw him into social talk. Gnawed by his splenetic mood, he sat twitching his beard, while to little purpose the hand of his servant, mute as that on the wall, slowly pushed over the canary. Lunch being over, they sat down on the cushioned transom, the servant placing a pillow behind his master. 
The long continuance of the calm had now affected the atmosphere. Don Benito sighed heavily, as if for breath. Why not adjourn to the cuddy, said Captain Delano. There is more air there, but the host sat silent and motionless. Meantime, his servant knelt before him with a large fan of feathers, and Francisco, coming in on tiptoes, handed the negro a little cup of aromatic waters, with which at intervals he chafed his master's brow, smoothing the hair along the temples as a nurse does a child's. He spoke no word. He only rested his eye on his master's, as if amid all Don Benito's distress, a little to refresh his spirit by the silent sight of fidelity. Presently, the ship's bell sounded two o'clock, and through the cabin windows, a slight rippling of the sea was discerned, and from the desired direction. There, exclaimed Captain Delano, I told you so, Don Benito, look. He had risen to his feet, speaking in a very animated tone, with a view the more to rouse his companion. But though the crimson curtain of the stern window near him that moment fluttered against his pale cheek, Don Benito seemed to have even less welcome for the breeze than the calm. Poor fellow, thought Captain Delano. Bitter experience has taught him that one ripple does not make a wind any more than one swallow a summer. But he is mistaken for once. I will get his ship in for him and prove it. Briefly alluding to his weak condition, he urged his host to remain quietly where he was, since he, Captain Delano, would with pleasure take upon himself the responsibility of making the best use of the wind. Upon gaining the deck, Captain Delano started at the unexpected figure of a twofold, monumentally fixed at the threshold, like one of those sculptured porters of black marble guarding the porches of Egyptian tombs. But this time, the start was perhaps purely physical. A twofold presence, singularly attesting dolicity even in sullenness, was contrasted with that of the hatchet polishers, who in patience evinced their industry, while both spectacles showed that lax as Don Benito's general authority might be, still, whenever he chose to exert it, no man so savage or colossal but must, more or less, bow. Snatching a trumpet which hung from the bulwarks, with a free step, Captain Delano advanced to the forward edge of the poop, issuing his orders in his best Spanish. The few sailors and many negroes, all equally pleased, obediently set about heading the ship towards the harbour. While giving some directions, suddenly Captain Delano heard a voice faithfully repeating his orders. Turning, he saw Babo, now for the time acting under the pilot, his original part of captain of the slaves. This assistance proved valuable. Tattered sails and warped yards were soon brought into some trim, and no brace or halyard was pulled but to the blithe songs of the inspirited Negroes. Good fellows, thought Captain Delano, a little training would make fine sailors of them. Why see, the very women pull and sing too. These must be some of those Ashanti negresses that make such capital soldiers, I've heard. But who's at the helm? I must have a good hand there. He went to sea. The San Dominic steered with a cumbrous tiller, with large horizontal pulleys attached. At each pulley end stood a subordinate black, and between them, at the tiller head, the responsible post, a Spanish seaman, whose countenance evinced his due share in the general hopefulness and confidence at the coming of the breeze. He proved the same man who had behaved with so shamefaced an air on the windlass. Ah, it is you, my man, exclaimed Captain Delano. Well, no more sheep eyes now. Look straight forward and keep the ship so. Good hand, I trust. I want to get into the harbour, don't you? The man assented with an inward chuckle, grasping the tiller head firmly. Upon this, unperceived by the American, the two blacks eyed the sailor intently. Finding all right at the helm, the pilot went forward to the forecastle to see how matters stood there. 
The ship now had way enough to breast the current. With the approach of evening, the breeze would be sure to freshen. Having done all that was needed for the present, Captain Delano, giving his last orders to the sailors, turned aft to report affairs to Don Benito in the cabin, perhaps additionally incited to rejoin him by the hope of snatching a moment's private chat while the servant was engaged upon deck. From opposite sides, there were beneath the poop two approaches to the cabin, one further forward than the other and consequently communicating with a longer passage. Marking the servant still above, Captain Delano taking the nitus entrance, the one last named and at whose porch a tufal still stood, hurried on his way till, arrived at the cabin threshold, he paused an instant, a little to recover from his eagerness. Then, with the words of his intended business upon his lips, he entered. As he advanced toward the seated Spaniard, he heard another footstep, keeping time with his. From the opposite door, a salver in hand, the servant was likewise advancing. Confound the faithful fellow, thought Captain Delano. What a vexatious coincidence! Possibly the vexation might have been something different, were it not for the brisk confidence inspired by the breeze. But even as it was, he felt a slight twinge from a sudden indefinite association in his mind of Babu with Atufo. Don Benito, said he, I give you joy. The breeze will hold and will increase. By the way, your tall man and timepiece, Atufo, stands without. By your order? By your order, of course. Don Benito recoiled as if at some bland satirical touch, delivered with such adroit garnish of apparent good breeding as to present no handle for retort. He is like one flayed alive, thought Captain Delano. Where may one touch him without causing a shrink? The servant moved before the master, adjusting a cushion, recalled to civility. The Spaniard stiffly replied, You are right. The slave appears where you saw him, according to my command, which is that if at the given hour I am below, he must take his hand and abide my coming. Ah, now, pardon me, but that is treating the poor fellow like an ex-king indeed. Ah, Don Benito, smiling, for all the license you permit in some things, I fear less that bottom, you are a bitter hard master. Again, Don Benito shrank, and this time, as the good sailor thought, from a genuine twinge of his confidence. Again, conversation became constrained. In vain, Captain Delano called attention to the now perceptible motion of the keel gently cleaving the sea. With a lacklustre eye, Don Benito returned words few and reserved. By and by, the wind having steadily risen and still blowing right into the harbour, bore the San Dominic swiftly on. Sounding a point of land, the sealer at distance came into open view. Meantime, Captain Delano had again repaired to the deck, remaining there some time, having at last altered the ship's course so as to give the reef a wide berth. He returned for a few moments below. I will cheer up my poor friend this time, thought he. Better and better, Don Benito, he cried as he blithely re-entered. There will soon be an end to your cares, at least for a while. For when, after a long, sad voyage, you know, the anchor drops into the haven, all its vast weight seems lifted from the captain's heart. We were getting on famously, Don Benito. My ship is in sight. Look through this side light here. There she is, all a taunt. Oh, the bachelor's delight, my good friend. Ah, how this wind braces one up. Come, you must take a cup of coffee with me this evening. My old steward will give you as fine a cup as ever any sultan tasted. What say you, Don Benito? Will you? At first, the Spaniards glanced feverishly up, casting a longing look towards the sealer, while with mute concern his servant gazed into his face. Suddenly the old ague of coldness returned, and dropping back to his cushions, he was silent. 
you do not answer. Come, all day you have been my host. Would you have hospitality all on one side? I cannot go, was the response. What? It will not fatigue you. The ships will lie together as near as they can, without swinging foul. It will be little more than stepping from deck to deck, which is but as from room to room. Come, come, you must not refuse me. I cannot go, decisively and repulsively, repeated Don Benito, renouncing all but the last appearance of courtesy, with a sort of cadaverous sullenness, and biting his thin nails to the quick. He glanced, almost glared at his guest, as if impatient that a stranger's presence should interfere with the full indulgence of his morbid hour. Meantime, the sound of the parted waters came more and more gurgingly and merrily in at the windows, as reproaching him from his dark spleen, as telling him that, sulk as he might, and go mad with it, nature cared not a jot, since whose fault was it, pray? But the foul mood was now at its depth, as the fair wind at its height. There was something in the man so far beyond any mere unsociality or sourness previously evinced that even the forbearing good nature of his guest could not endure it. Wholly at a loss to account for such demeanour and deeming sickness with eccentricity, however extreme, no adequate excuse, well satisfied too that nothing in his own conduct could justify it, Captain Delano's pride began to be roused. Himself became reserved, but all seemed one to the Spaniard. Quitting him, therefore, Captain Delano once more went to the deck. The ship was now within less than two miles of the sealer. The whaleboat was seen darting over the interval. To be brief, the two vessels, thanks to the pilot's skill, ere long neighbourly style, lay anchored together. Before returning to his own vessel, Captain Delano had intended communicating to Don Benito the smaller details of the proposed services to be rendered. But as it was, unwilling anew to subject himself to rebuffs, he resolved, now that he had seen the San Dominique safely moored, immediately to quit her, without further allusion to hospitality or business indefinitely postponing his ulterior plans, he would regulate his future actions according to future circumstances. His boat was ready to receive him, but his host still tarried below. Well, thought Captain Delano, if he has little breathing, the more need to show mine. He descended to the cabin to be the ceremonious and, it may be, tacitly rebukeful adieu. But to his great satisfaction, Don Benito, as if he began to feel the weight of that treatment with which his sighted guest had, not indecorously, retaliated upon him, now supported by his servant, rose to his feet and, grasping Captain Delano's hand, stood tremulous, too much agitated to speak. But the good augury, hence drawn, was suddenly dashed by his resuming all his previous reserve with augmented gloom, as with half-averted eyes, he silently reseated himself on his cushions. With a corresponding return of his own chilled feelings, Captain Delano bowed and withdrew. He was hardly midway in the narrow corridor, dim as a tunnel, leading from the cabin to the stairs, when a sound, as of the toiling for execution in some jail yard, fell on his ears. It was the echo of the ship's flawed bell, striking the hour, drearily reverberated in his subterranean vault. Instantly, by a fatality not to be withstood, his mind, responsive to the portent, swarmed with superstitious suspicions. He paused, his images far swifter than these sentences, the minutest details of all his former distrusts, swept through him. Hitherto, credulous good nature had been too ready to furnish excuses for reasonable fears. Why was the Spaniard so superfluously punctilious at times, now heedless of common propriety in not accompanying to the side of his departing guest? Did indisposition forbid? Indisposition had not forbidden more irksome exertion that day. 
his last equivocal demeanour recurred. He had risen to his feet, grasped his guest's hand, motioned towards his hat. Then, in an instant, all was eclipsed in sinister muteness and gloom. Did this imply one brief repentant relenting at the final moment from some iniquitous plot, followed by remorseless return to it? His last glance seemed to express a calamitous yet acquiescent farewell to Captain Delano forever. Why decline the invitation to visit the sealer that evening? Or was the Spaniard less hardened than the Jew who refrained not from supping at the board of him whom the same night he meant to betray? What imported all those day-long enigmas and contradictions except they were intended to mystify, preliminary to some stealthy blow? Atufal, the pretended rebel but punctual shadow, that moment lurked by the threshold without. He seemed a sentry and more. Who, by his own confession, had stationed him there? Was the Negro now lying in wait? The Spaniard behind, his creature before, to rush from darkness to light was the involuntary choice. The next moment, with clenched jaw and hand, he passed the far and stood unharmed in the light as he saw his trim ship lying peacefully at anchor and almost within ordinary call, as he saw his household boat with familiar faces in it, patiently rising and falling on the short waves by the San Dominic side, and then, glancing about the decks where he stood, saw the oakum pickers still gravely plying their fingers, and heard the low, buzzing whistle and industrious hum of the hatchet polishers, still bestirring themselves over their endless occupation, and more than all, as he saw the benign aspect of nature taking her innocent repose in the evening, the screened sun in the quiet camp of the west, shining out like the mild light from Abraham's tent as charmed eye and ear took in all these, with the chained figure of the black, clenched jaw and hand, relaxed. Once again he smiled at the phantoms which had mocked him and felt something like a tinge of remorse that, by harbouring them even for a moment, he should, by implication, have betrayed an atheist doubt of the ever-watchful providence above. There was a few minutes' delay while, in obedience to his orders, the boat was being hooked along to the gangway. During this interval, A sort of saddened satisfaction stole over Captain Delano at thinking of the kindly offices he had that day discharged for a stranger. Ah, thought he, after good actions one's conscience is never ungrateful, however much so the benefited party may be. Presently his foot, in the first act of descent into the boat, pressed the first round of the side ladder. His face presented inward upon the deck. In the same moment, he heard his name courteously sounded and, to his pleased surprise, saw Don Benito advancing, an unwanted energy in his air, as if, at the last moment, intent upon making amends for his recent discourtesy. With instinctive good feeling, Captain Delano, withdrawing his foot, turned and reciprocally advanced. As he did so, the Spaniard's nervous eagerness increased, but his vital energy failed so that, to better support him, the servant, placing his master's hand on his naked shoulder and gently holding it there, formed himself into a sort of crutch. When the two captains met, the Spaniard again fervently took the hand of the American, at the same time casting an earnest glance into his eyes, but as before, too much overcome to speak. I have done him wrong, self-reproachingly thought Captain Delano. His apparent coldness has deceived me. In no instance has he meant to offend. Meantime, as if fearful that the countenance of the scene might too much unstring his master, the servant seemed anxious to terminate it. And so, still presenting himself as a crutch and walking between the two captains, he advanced with them towards the gangway while still as if full of kindly contrition, Don Benito would not let go of the hand of 
Captain Delano, but retained it in his, across the black's body. Soon they were standing by the side, looking over the boat, whose crew turned up their curious eyes. Waiting a moment for the Spaniard to relinquish his hold, the now embarrassed Captain Delano lifted his foot to overstep the threshold of the open gangway. But still Don Benito would not let go his hand. And yet, with an agitated tone, he said, I can go no further. Here I must bid you adieu. Adieu, my dear, dear Don Amasa. Go, go, suddenly tearing his hand loose. Go, and God guard you better than me, my best friend. Not unaffected, Captain Delano would now have lingered, but catching the meekly admonitory eye of his servant with a hasty farewell, he descended into his boat, following by the continual adieus of Don Benito, standing rooted in the gangway. Seating himself in the stern, Captain Delano, making a last salute, ordered the boat shoved off. The crew had their oars on end. The bowsmen pushed the boat a sufficient distance for the oars to be lengthwise dropped. The instant that was done, Don Benito sprang over the bulwarks, falling at the feet of Captain Delano, at the same time calling towards his ship, but in tones so frenzied that none in the boat could understand him. But, as if not equally obtuse, three sailors from three different and distant parts of the ship splashed into the sea, swimming after their captain, as if intent upon his rescue. The dismayed officer of the boat eagerly asked what this meant, to which Captain Delano, turning a disdainful smile upon an unaccountable Spaniard, answered that, for his part, he neither knew nor cared, but it seemed as if Don Benito had taken it into his head to produce impression among his people that the boat wanted to kidnap him. Or else give way for your lives, he wildly added, starting at a clattering hubbub in the ship, above which rang the toxin of the hatchet polishers, and seizing Don Benito by the throat, he added, This plotting pirate means murder. Here, in apparent verification of the words, the servant, a dagger in his hand, was seen on the rail overhead, poised in the act of leaping, as if with desperate fidelity to befriend his master to the last. While, seemingly, to aid the black, the three white sailors were trying to clamber into the hampered bow. Meantime, the whole host of Negroes, as if inflamed at the sight of their jeopardized captain, impended in one sooty avalanche over the bulwarks. All this, with what preceded and what followed, occurred with such involutions of rapidity that past, present and future seemed one. Seeing the Negro coming, Captain Delano had flung the Spaniard aside, almost in the very act of clutching him, and by the unconscious recoil, shifting his place with arms thrown up, so promptly grappled the servant in his descent, that with dagger presented at Captain Delano's heart, the black seemed of purpose to have leaped there as to his mark. But the weapon was wrenched away, and the assailant dashed into the bottom of the boat, which now, with this tangled oars, began to speed through the sea. At this juncture, the left hand of Captain Delano on one side again clutched the half-reclined Don Benito, heedless that he was in a speechless faint, while his right foot on the other side ground the prostrate negro and his right arm pressed for added speed on the after oar, his eye bent forward, encouraging his men to do their utmost. But here, the officer of the boat, who had at last succeeded in beating off the towing sailors, and was now, with face turned aft, assisting the bowsman at his oar, suddenly called to Captain Delano to see what the black was about, while a Portuguese oarsman shouted to him to give heed to what the Spaniard was saying. Glancing down at his feet, Captain Delano saw the freed hand of the servant, aiming with a second dagger, a small one, before concealed in his wool, 
With this, he was snakishly writhing up from the boat's bottom at the heart of his master, his countenance lividly vindictive, expressing the centred purpose of his soul, while the Spaniard, half choked, was vainly shrinking away with husky words incoherent to all but the Portuguese. That moment, across the long benighted mind of Captain Delano, a flash of revelation swept, illuminating in unanticipated clearness his host's whole mysterious demeanour with every enigmatic event of the day, as well as the entire past voyage of the San Dominic. He smote Babo's hand down, but his own heart smote him harder. With infinite pity, he withdrew his hold from Don Benito. Not Captain Delano, but Don Benito. The black, in leaping into the boat, had intended to stab. Both the black's hands were held as glancing up towards the San Dominic. Captain Delano, now with scales dropped from his eyes, saw the Negroes, not in misrule, not in tumult, not as if frantically concerned for Don Benito, but with mask torn away, flourishing hatchets and knives in ferocious, piratical revolt. Like delirious black dervishes, the six Ashantis danced on the poop. Prevented by their foes from springing into the water, the Spanish boys were hurrying up to the topmost spars, while such of the few Spanish sailors, not already in the sea, less alert, were described, helplessly mixed in on deck with the blacks. Meantime, Captain Delano hailed his own vessel, ordering the ports up and the guns run out. But by this time, the cable of the San Dominic had been cut and the fag end, in lashing out, whipped away the canvas shroud about the beak. Suddenly revealing as the bleached hull swung round towards the open ocean, death for the figurehead in a human skeleton. Chalky comment on the chalked words below. Follow your leader. At the sight, Don Benito, covering his face, wailed out, "'Tis he, Aranda, my murdered, unburied friend!" Upon reaching the sealer, calling for ropes, Captain Delano bound a negro who made no resistance and had him hoisted to the deck. He would then have assisted the now almost helpless Don Benito up the side, but Don Benito, wan as he was, refused to move or be moved until the negro should have been first put below out of view. When presently assured that it was done, he no more shrank from the ascent. The boat was immediately dispatched back to pick up the three swimming sailors. Meantime, the guns were in readiness, though owing to the San Dominic having glided somewhat astern of the sealer, only the aftermost one could be brought to bear. With this, they fired six times, thinking to cripple the fugitive ship by bringing down her spars, but only a few inconsiderable ropes were shot away. Soon, the ship was beyond the gun's range, steering broad out of the bay. The blacks thickly clustering round the bowsprit, one moment with taunting cries toward the whites, the next with upthrown gestures hailing the now dusky moors of ocean-coring crows escaped from the hand of the fowler. The first impulse was to slip the cables and give chase, but upon second thoughts, to pursue with whaleboat and yawl seemed more promising. Upon inquiring of Don Benito what firearms they had on board the San Dominic, Captain Delano was answered that they had none that could be used, because in the earlier stages of the mutiny, a cabin passenger since dead had secretly put out of order the locks of what few muskets there were. But with all his remaining strength, Don Benito entreated the American not to give chase, either with ship or boat, for the Negroes had already proved themselves such desperados that, in case of a present assault, nothing but a total massacre of the whites could be looked for. But regarding this warning as coming from one whose spirit had been crushed by misery, the American did not give up his design. 
The boats were got ready and armed. Captain Delano ordered his men into them. He was going himself when Don Benito grasped his arm. What? Have you saved my life, senor? And are you now going to throw away your own? The officers also, for reasons connected with their interests and those of the voyage, and the duty owing to the owners, strongly objected against their commander's going. Weighing their remonstrance in a moment, Captain Delano felt bound to remain, appointing his chief mate, an athletic and resolute man, who had been a privateer's man, to head the party. The more to encourage the sailors, they were told, that the Spanish captain considered his ships good as lost, that she and her cargo, including some gold and silver, were worth more than a thousand doubloons. Take her, and no small part should be theirs, the sailors replied with a shout. The fugitives had now almost gained an offing. It was nearly night, but the moon was rising. After hard, prolonged pulling, the boats came up on the ship's quarters at a suitable distance, laying upon their rules to discharge their muskets. Having no bullets to return, the Negroes sent their yells, but upon the second volley, Indian-like, they hurtled their hatchets. One took off a sailor's fingers, another struck the whale boat's bow. Cutting off the rope there and remaining struck in the gunwale like a woodman's axe. Snatching it, quivering from its lodgment, the mate hurled it back. The returned gauntlet now struck in the ship's broken quarter gallery and so remained. The Negroes given too hot a reception, the whites kept a more respectful distance, hovering now just out of reach of the hurtling hatchets. They, with a view to the close encounter which must soon come, sought to decoy the blacks into entirely disarming themselves of their most murderous weapons in a hand-to-hand fight by foolishly flinging them as missiles, short of the mark, into the sea. But ere long perceiving the stratagem, the Negroes desisted, though not before many of them had to replace their lost hatchets with spikes, an exchange which, as counted upon, proved in the end favourable to the assailants. Meantime, with a strong wind, the ship still clove the water, the bolts alternately falling behind and pulling up to discharge fresh volleys. The fire was most directly towards the stern, since there, chiefly the Negroes at present were clustering. But to kill or maim the Negroes was not the object. To take them with the ship was the object. To do it, the ship must be boarded, which could not be done by boats while she was sailing so fast. A thought now struck the mate. Observing the Spanish boys still aloft, high as they could get, he called to them to descend to the yards and to cut adrift the sails. It was done. About this time, owing to causes hereafter to be shown, two Spaniards, in the dress of sailors, and conspicuously showing themselves, were killed, not by volleys, but by deliberate marksman's shots, while, as it afterwards appeared, by one of the general discharges, a twofold, the black and the Spaniard at the helm, likewise were killed. What now with the loss of the sails and loss of leaders, the ship became unmanageable to the Negroes. With creaking masts, she came heavily round to the wind, the prow slowly swinging into view of the boats, its skeleton gleaming in the horizontal moonlight and casting a gigantic ribbed shadow upon the water. One extended arm of the ghost seemed beckoning the whites to avenge it. Follow your leader, cried the mate, and one on each bow. The boats boarded. Sealing spears and cutlasses, crossed hatchets and handspikes huddled upon the long boat amidships. The negresses raised a wailing chant whose chorus was the clash of the steel. For a time, the attack wavered, the negroes wedging themselves to beat it back. The half-repelled sailors, as yet unable to gain a footing, fighting as troopers in the saddle, one leg sidewards, flung over the bulwarks, and one without, plying their cutlasses like carters' whips. But 
in vain. They were almost overborne when, rallying them into a squad as one man with a huzzah, they sprang inboard, were entangled for a few breaths' space. There was a vague, muffled inner sound, as of submerged swordfish rushing hither and thither through shoals of blackfish. Soon, in a reunited band and joined by the Spanish seamen, the whites came to the surface, irresistibly driving the negroes toward the stern. But a barricade of casks and sacks from side to side had been thrown up by the main mast. Here the negroes faced about, those scorning peace or truce, fain would have had respite. But without pause, overleaping the barrier, the unflagging sailors again closed. Exhausted, the blacks now fought in despair. Their red tongues lolled, wolf-like, from their mouths. But the pale sailors' teeth were set. Not a word was spoken, and in five minutes more, the ship was won. Nearly a score of Negroes were killed, exclusively of those by the bulls. Many were mangled, their wounds mostly inflicted by the long edged sealing spears, resembling those shaven ones of the English at Preston Pans, made by the polled skides of the Highlanders. On the other side, none were killed, though several were wounded, some severely, including the mate. The surviving Negroes were temporarily secured, and the ship, towed back into the harbour at midnight, once more lay anchored. Omitting the incidents and arrangements ensuing, suffice it that, after two days spent in refitting, the ship sailed in company for Conception in Chile, and thence for Lima, in Peru, where, before the vice-regal courts, the whole affair from the beginning underwent investigation. Though midway on the passage, the ill-fated Spaniard, relaxed from constraint, showed some signs of regaining health with free will, yet, agreeably with his own foreboding, shortly before arriving at Lima, he relapsed, finally becoming so reduced as to be carried ashore in arms. Hearing of his story and plight, one of the many religious institutions of the City of Kings opened an hospitable refuge to him, where both physician and priest were his nurses, and a member of the order volunteered to be his one special guardian and consoler by night and by day. The following extracts, translated from one of the official Spanish documents, will, it is hoped, shed light on the preceding narrative, as well as, in the first place, reveal the true port of departure and true history of the San Dominic's voyage down to the time of her touching at the island of St. Maria. But ere the extracts come, it may be well to preface them with a remark. The document selected from, among many others, for partial translation, contains the deposition of Benito Serino, the first taken in the case. Some disclosures therein were, at the time, held dubious for both learned and natural reasons. The tribunal inclined to the opinion that the, the deponent, not undistributed in his mind by recent events, raved of some things that could never have happened. But subsequent depositions of the surviving sailors, bearing out the revelations of their captain in several of the strangest particulars, gave credence to the rest. So that the tribunal, in its final decision, rested its capital sentences upon statements which, had they lacked confirmation, would have deemed it but duty to reject. I, Don Jose Diabos and Padilla, His Majesty's notary for the royal revenue and register of this province, and notary public of the holy crusade of this bishopric, etc., do certify and declare as much as it is requisite in law that, in the criminal cause commenced the 24th of the month of September, in the year 1799, against the Negroes of the ship San Dominic, the following declaration before me was made. Declaration of the First Witness, Don Benito Serino. The same day and month and year, 
His Honour, Dr. Juan Martinez de Rosas, Councillor of the Royal Audience of this Kingdom and learned in the law of this intendancy, ordered the captain of the ship San Dominic, Don Benito Serino, to appear, which he did, in his litter, attended by the monk in Feles, of whom he received the oath which he took by God our Lord, and a sign under which he promised to tell the truth of whatever he should know and should be asked. And being interrogated agreeably to the tenor of the act commencing the process, he said that on the 20th of May last, he set sail with his ship from the port of Valparaiso, bound to that of Caleo, loaded with the produce of the country, besides 30 cases of hardware and 160 blacks of both sexes, mostly belonging to Don Alexandro Aranda, gentleman of the city of Mendoza, and that the crew of the ship consisted of 36 men, beside the person who went as passengers, that the Negroes were in part as follows. Here, in the original, follows a list of some 50 names, descriptions and ages, compiled from certain recovered documents of Arandas, and also from recollections of the deponent, from which portions only are extracted. One from about 18 to 19 years named Jose, and this was the man that's waited upon his master, Don Alexandro, and who speaks well the Spanish, having served him for four or five years. A mulatto named Francesco, the cabin steward, of a good person and voice, having sung in the Valparaiso churches, native of the province of Buenos Aires, aged about 35 years, a smart negro named Dago, who had been, for many years, a grave digger among the Spaniards, aged 46. Four old Negroes born in Africa from 60 to 70, but sound, corkers by trade, whose names are as follows. The first was named Muri, and he was killed, as was also his son named Diamelo. The second, Nacta. The third, Yola. Likewise killed. The fourth, Hofen, and six full-grown Negroes aged 30 to 45 all raw and born among the Ashantis, Matiluqui, Yan, Lechi, Mapenda, Yambayo, Akim, four of whom were killed, a powerful Negro named Atufal, and being supposed to have been a chief in Africa, his owner set great store by him, and a small Negro, Senegal. But some years among the Spaniards, aged about 30, which Negro's name was Babo. That he does not remember the names of the others, but that still expecting the residue of Don Alexandre's papers will be found, will then take due account of them all and remit to the court, and 39 women and children of all ages. The catalogue over, the deposition goes on. That all the Negroes slept upon deck as is customary in this navigation, and none wore fetters, because the owner, his friend Aranda, told him that they were all tractable. That on the seventh day after leaving port, at three o'clock in the morning, all the Spaniards being asleep, except the two officers on the watch, who were the boatswain, Juan Robles, and the carpenter, Juan Bautista Gayet, and the helmsman and his boy, the Negroes revolted suddenly, wounded dangerously the boatswain and the carpenter, and successfully killed eighteen men of those who were sleeping on deck, with some hand spikes and hatchets, and others by throwing them alive overboard and tying them, that the Spaniards upon deck, they left about seven, as he thinks, alive and tied, to manoeuvre the ship, and three or four more, who hid themselves, remained also alive. Although in the act of revolt, the Negroes made themselves masters of the hatchway, six or seven wounded went through it to the cockpit, without any hindrance on their part, that during the act of revolt, the mate and another person, whose name he does not recollect, attempted to come up through the hatchway, but 
being quickly wounded, were obliged to return to the cabin. That the deponent resolved at break of day to come up to the companionway where the Negro Babo was, being the ringleader and the twofold who assisted him, and having spoken to them, exhorted them to cease committing such atrocities, asking them at the same time what they wanted and intended to do, offering himself to obey their commands, that notwithstanding this, they threw in his presence three men alive and tied overboard, and they told the deponent to come up, and that they would not kill him, which having done, the negro Babo asked him whether there were in those seas any negro countries where they might be carried, and he answered them, no. That the negro Babo afterwards told him to carry them to Senegal, or to the neighbouring islands of St. Nicholas, and he answered that this was impossible on account of the great distance, the necessity involved of rounding Cape Horn, the bad condition of the vessel, the want of provisions, sails and water, but that the negro Babo replied to him he must carry them in any way, that they would do and conform themselves to everything the deponent should require as to eating and drinking, and after a long conference, being absolutely compelled to please them, for they threatened to kill all the whites if they were not, at all events, carried to Senegal. He told them that what was most wanting for the voyage was water, that they would go near the coast to take it, and thence they would proceed on their course, that the negro Babo agreed to it, and the deponent steered towards the immediate ports, hoping to meet some Spanish or foreign vessel that would save them, that within ten or eleven days they saw the land and continued their course by it in the vicinity of Nazca that the deponent observed that the negroes were now restless and mutinous because he did not effect the taking in of water, the negro Babo having required with threats that it should be done without fail the following day. He told him he saw plainly that the coast was steep and the rivers designated in the maps were not to be found with other reasons suitable to the circumstances, that the best way would be to go to the island of Santa Maria, where they might water easily, it being a solitary island, as the foreigners did, that the deponent did not go to Pisco, that was near, nor make any other port of the coast, because the negro Babo had intimated to him several times that he would kill all the whites the very moment he should perceive any city, town or settlement of any kind on the shores to which they should be carried that having determined to go to the island of Santa Maria as the deponent had planned for the purpose of trying whether on the passage or near the island itself they could find any vessel that should favour them or whether they should escape from it in a boat to the neighbouring coast of Aruco. To adopt the necessary means, he immediately changed his course, steering for the island that the Negroes Babo and the Tufo held daily conferences in which they discussed what was necessary for their design of returning to Senegal, whenever they were to kill all the Spaniards, and particularly the deponent. That eighty days after parting from the coast of Nazca, the deponent being on the watch a little after daybreak, and soon after the Negroes had their meeting, the Negro Babo came to the place where the deponent was, and told him that he had determined to kill his master, Don Alexandro Aranda, both because he and his companions could not otherwise be sure of their liberty, and that to keep the seamen in subjection, he wanted to prepare a warning of what road they should be made to take, did they or any of them oppose him, and that, by means of the death of Don Alexandro, that warning would be given best, but that, what this last meant, the deponent did not at the time comprehend, nor could not, further than that, the death of Don Alexandre was intended. And moreover, the Negro Babo proposed to the deponent to call the mate Ranets, who was sleeping in the cabin, before the thing was done, for fear that the deponent understood it, 
that the mate who was a good navigator should be killed with Don Alexandro and the rest. That the deponent who was the friend from youth of Don Alexandro prayed and conjured, but all was useless. For the Negro Babu answered him that the thing could not be prevented and that all the Spaniards risked their death if they should attempt to frustrate his will in the matter. Or any other that, in this conflict, the deponent called the mate, Ranets, who was forced to go apart, and immediately the Negro Babo commanded the Ashanti Martiniqui and the Ashanti Lekbi to go and commit the murder, that those two went down with hatchets to the birth of Don Alexandro, that, yet half alive and mangled, they dragged him on deck, and that they were going to throw him overboard in that state. But the Negro Babo stopped them, bidding the murder be completed on the deck before him, which was done when, by his orders, the body was carried below, forward, that nothing more was seen of it by the deponent for three days. That Don Alonso Sidonia, an old man, long resident at Valparaiso, and lately appointed to a civil office in Peru, whither he had taken passage, was at the same time sleeping in the berth opposite Don Alexandro's, that awakening at his cries, surprised by them, and at the sight of the Negroes, with their bloody hatchets in their hands, he threw himself into the sea, through a window which was near him, and was drowned, without it being in power of the deponent to assist or take him up. That a short time after killing Aranda, they brought upon deck his German cousin of middle age, Don Francisco Massa of Mendoza, and the young Don Joaquin, Marquez de Arambolaza. Then lately from Spain, with his Spanish servants, Ponce, and the three young clerks of Aranda, Jose Mozari Lorenzo, Lorenzo Vargas, and Terminegildo, Grandix, all of Cadiz, that Don Joaquin and Hermenegildo Grandix, the Negro Babo, for purposes hereafter to appear, preserved alive. But Don Francisco Massa, Jose Mozari, and Lorenzo Vargas, with Ponce the servant, beside the boatswain, Juan Robles, the boatswain's mates, Manuel Vizcaya, and Rodrigo Herta, and four of the sailors, the Negro Babo ordered to be thrown alive into the sea, although they made no resistance, nor begged for anything else but mercy, that the boatswain, Juan Robles, who knew how to swim, kept the longest above water, making acts of contrition, and, in the last words he uttered, charged this deponent to cause mass to be said for his soul to Our Lady of Succor that during the three days which followed, the deponent, uncertain what fate had befallen the remains of Don Alexandro, frequently asked the Negro Babu where they were, and if still on board, whether they were to be preserved for interment ashore, entreating him to so order it that the Negro Babu answered nothing till the fourth day. When at sunrise, the deponent coming on deck, the Negro Babu showed him a skeleton which had been substituted for the ship's proper figurehead, the image of Christopher Colon, the discoverer of the new world. That the Negro Babo asked him whose skeleton that was, and whether from its whiteness he should not think it a white, that upon discovering his face, the Negro Babo, coming close, said words to this effect, Keep faith with the blacks from here to Senegal, or you shall in spirit, as now in body, follow your leader, pointing to the prow, that the same morning the Negro Babo took by succession each Spaniard forward and asked him whose skeleton that was and whether from its whiteness he should not think it a white, that each Spaniard covered his face, that then to each the Negro Babo repeated the words in the first place said to the deponent, that they, the Spaniards, being then assembled aft, the Negro Babo harangued them saying that he had now done all that the opponent as navigator for the Negroes might pursue his course, warning him and all of them that they should, 
soul and body, go the way of Don Alexandro if he saw them, the Spaniards, speak, or plot anything against them, the Negroes, a threat which was repeated every day, that, before the events last mentioned, they had tied the cook to throw him overboard, for it is not known what thing they heard him speak. But finally the Negro Babo spared his life at the request of the deponent, that a few days after, the deponent, endeavouring not to omit any means to preserve the lives of the remaining whites, spoke to the Negroes' peace and tranquillity, and agreed to draw up a paper signed by the deponent and the sailors who could write, as also by the Negro Babu for himself and all the blacks, in which the deponent obliged himself to carry them to Senegal, and they not to kill any more, and he formally to make over to them the ship with the cargo with which they were for that time satisfied and quieted. But the next day, the more surely to guard against the sailors' escape, the Negro Babo commanded all the boats to be destroyed, but the long boat, which was unseaworthy, and another, a cutter in good condition, which, knowing it would yet be wanted for towing the water casks, he had it lowered down into the hold. Various particulars of the prolonged and perplexed navigation ensuing here follow, with incidents of a calamitous calm, from which portion one passage is extracted to wit. That on the fifth day of the calm, all on board suffering much from the heat and want of water, and five having died in fits and mad, the Negroes became irritable, and for a chance gesture, which they deemed suspicious, though it was harmless, made by the mate, Granets, to the deponent in the act of handing a quadrant, they killed him, but that for this they afterwards were sorry, the mate being the only remaining navigator on board except the deponent. That omitting other events which daily happen, and which can only serve uselessly to recall past misfortunes and conflicts, after 73 days' navigation, reckoned from the time they sailed from Nazca, during which they navigated under a scanty allowance of water, and were afflicted with the calms before mentioned, they at last arrived at this island of Santa Maria, on the 17th of the month of August, at about six o'clock in the afternoon, at which hour they cast anchor very near the American ship, Bachelor's Delight, which lay in the same bay, commanded by the generous Captain Amasa Delano. But at six o'clock in the morning, they had already described the port, and the Negroes became uneasy as soon as at distance they saw the ship, not having expected to see one there, that the Negro Babo pacified them, assuring them that no fear need be had, that straight away he ordered the figure on the bow to be covered with canvas as for repairs and had the decks a little set in order, that for a time the Negro Babo and the Negro Atufo conferred, and the Negro Atufo was for sailing away, but the Negro Babo would not, and by himself cast about what to do, that at last he came to the deponent, proposing to him to say and do all that the deponent declares to have said and done to the American captain. That the Negro Babo warned him that if he varied in the least, or uttered any word, or gave any look that should give the least intimation of past events or present state, he would instantly kill him with all his companions, showing the dagger which he carried hid, saying something which, as he understood it, meant that the dagger would be alert in his eye, that the Negro Babo then announced the plan to all his companions, which pleased them, that he then, the better to disguise the truth, devised many expedients, in some of them, uniting deceit and defence, that of this sort was the device of the six Ashantis before named, who were his bravos, that them he stationed on the break of the poop, as if to clean certain hatchets in cases which were part of the cargo, but in reality to use them and distribute them at need, and at a given word he told them that, 
among other devices, was the device of presenting a twofold, his right-hand man, as chained, though in the moment the chains could be dropped, but in every particular he informed the deponent that what part he was expecting to enact in every device, and what story he was to tell on every occasion. Always threatening him with instant death if he varied in the least, that, conscious that many of the Negroes would be turbulent, the Negro Babu appointed the four aged Negroes who were caulkers to keep what domestic order they could on the decks. That again and again he harangued the Spaniards and his companions, informing them of his intent and of his devices and of the invented story that this deponent was to tell, charging them lest any of them varied from that story, that these arrangements were made and matured during the interval of two or three hours between their first sighting the ship and the arrival on board of Captain Amasa Delano. That this happened about half past seven o'clock in the morning, Captain Amasa Delano coming in his boat and all gladly receiving him, that the deponent, as well as he could force himself, acting then the part of principal owner and the free captain of the ship, told Captain Amasa Delano, when called upon, that he came from Buenos Aires, bound to Lima, with 300 Negroes, that off Cape Horn, and in a subsequent fever, many Negroes had died, that also, by similar casualties, all the sea officers of the greatest part of the crew had died. And so the deposition goes on, circumstantially recounting the fictitious story dedicated to the deponents by Babo, and through the deponent imposed upon Captain Delano, and also recounting the friendly offers of Captain Delano with other things, but all of which is here omitted, after the fictitious story, the deposition proceeds. That the generous Captain Amata Delano remained on board all the day, till he left the ship anchored at six o'clock in the evening. The opponent speaking to him always of his pretended misfortunes, under the forementioned principles, without having had it in his power to tell a single word or give them the least hint that he might know the truth and state of things, because the Negro Babo, performing the office of an officious servant with all the appearance of submission of the humble slave, did not leave the deponent one moment, that this was in order to observe the deponent's actions and words, for the Negro Babo understands well the Spanish. And besides, there were thereabout some others who were constantly on the watch, and likewise understood the Spanish, that upon one occasion, while the deponent was standing on the deck, conversing with Amasa Delano by a secret sign, the Negro Babo drew him, the deponent, aside the act appearing as if originating with the deponent, that then, he being drawn aside, the Negro Babo proposed to him to gain from Amasa Delano full particulars about his ship and crew and arms, that the deponent asked for what, that the Negro Babo answered he might conceive that, grieved at the prospect of what might overtake the generous Captain Amasa Delano, the deponent at first refused to ask the desired questions and used every argument to induce the Negro Babo to give up this new design, that the Negro Babo showed the point of his dagger, that after the information had been obtained, the Negro Babo again drew him aside, telling him that the very night he, the deponent, would be captain of the two ships instead of one, for that great part of the American ship's crew being to be absent fishing, and six Ashantis, without anyone else, would easily take it. That at this time, he said other things to the same purpose, that no entreaties availed, that before Amasa Delano's coming on board, no hint had been given touching the capture of the American ship, that to prevent this project, the deponent was powerless that in some things his memory is confused. He cannot distinctly recall every event, that as soon as they had cast anchor at six o'clock in the evening, as has before been stated, the American captain took leave to return to his vessel, 
that upon a sudden impulse, which the deponent believes to have come from God and his angels, he, after the farewell had been said, followed the generous Captain Amasa Delano as far as the gun wall, where he stayed, under the pretense of taking leave, until Amasa Delano should have been seated in his boat, that all showing off, the deponent sprang from the gun wall into the boat and fell into it. He knows not how, God guarding him. Here, in the original, follows the account of what further happened at the escape, and how the San Dominic was retaken, and of the passage to the coast, including in the recital many expressions of eternal gratitude to the generous Captain Amasa Delano. The deposition then proceeds with recapitulatory remarks and the partial remuneration of the Negroes, making record of their individual part in the past events, with a view to furnishing, according to command of the court, the data whereon to found the criminal sentences to be pronounced. From this portion is the following. That he believes that all the Negroes, though not in the first place knowing to the design of revolt, when it was accomplished, approved it. That the Negro, Jose, 18 years old, and in the personal service of Don Alexandro, was the one who communicated the information to the Negro, Babo, about the state of the things in the cabin before the revolt. That this is known because in the preceding midnight, he used to come from his berth, which was under his master's, in the cabin, to the deck where the ringleader and his associates were and had secret conversations with the Negro Babo, in which he was several times seen by the mate, that one night the mate drove him away twice, that this same Negro, Jose, was the one who, without being commanded to do so by the Negro Babo, as Lekby and Martinqui were, stabbed his master, Don Alexandro, after he had been dragged, half lifeless, to the deck, that the mulatto steward, Francisco, was of the first band of revolters, that he was in all things the creature and tool of the Negro Babo, that to make his court, he just before a repast in the cabin, proposed to the Negro Babo, poisoning a dish for this generous Captain Amasa Delano. This is known and believed because the Negroes have said it, but that the Negro Babo, having another design, forbade Francisco that the Ashanti Lekbi was one of the worst of them, for that on the day the ship was retaken, he assisted in the defence of her, with a hatchet in each hand, with one of which he wounded in the breast the chief mate of Amasa Delano in the first act of boarding. This all knew that, in sight of the deponent, Lekbi struck with a hatchet Don Francisco Massa, when, by the Negro Babo's orders, he was carrying him to throw him overboard, alive, beside participating in the murder before mentioned of Don Alexandro, Aranda, and others of the cabin passengers, that, owing to the fury with which the Ashantis fought in the engagement with the boats, but this Lekbi and Yan survived, that Yan was bad as Lekbi, that Yan was the man who, by Babo's command, willingly prepared the skeleton of Don Alexandro, in a way the Negroes afterwards told the deponent, but which he, so long as reason is left him, can never divulge, that Yan and Lekby were the two who, in a calm by night, riveted the skeleton to the bow. This also the Negroes told him, that the Negro Babu was he who traced the inscription below it, that the Negro Babu was the plotter from first to last, he ordered every murder and was the helm and keel of the revolt, and that a twofold was his lieutenant in all, but a twofold with his own hand committed no murder, nor did the Negro Babo. That a twofold was shot, being killed in the fight with the boats, air boarding, that the Negresses of age were knowing to the revolt, and testified themselves, satisfied at the death of their master, Don Alexandro that had the Negroes not restrained them, they would have tortured to death, instead of simply killing the Spaniards slain by command of the Negro Babo, that the Negresses used their utmost influence to have the deponent made away with, that in the various acts of murder, 
They sang songs and danced, not gaily, but solemnly. And before the engagement with the boats, as well as during the action, they sang melancholy songs to the Negroes, and that his melancholy tone was more inflaming than a different one would have been, and was so intended that all this is believed because the Negroes have said it, that of the 36 men of the crew, exclusive of the passengers, all of whom are now dead, which the deponent had knowledge of, six only remained alive with four cabin boys and ship boys, not included with the crew, that the Negroes broke an arm of one of the cabin boys and gave him strokes with hatchets. The following various random disclosures referring to various periods of time, the following are extracted. That during the presence of Captain Amata Delano on board, some attempts were made by the sailors and one by Hermenegildo Gandix to convey hints to him of the true state of affairs, but that these attempts were ineffectual owing to fear of incurring death and furthermore owing to the devices which offered contradictions to the true state of affairs as well as owing to the generosity and piety of Amasa Delano incapable of sounding such wickedness. That Lois Galgo, a sailor about 60 years of age and formerly of the King's Navy, was one of those who sought to convey tokens to Captain Amasa Delano, but his intent, though undiscovered, being suspected, he was, on a pretense, made to retire out of sight and at last into the hold, and there was made away with. This the Negroes have since said, that one of the ship boys, feeling from Captain Amasa Delano's presence, some hopes of release, and not having enough prudence, dropped some chance word respecting his expectations, which being overheard and understood by a slave boy with whom he was eating at the time, the latter struck him on the head with a knife, inflicting a bad wound, but of which the boy is now healing, that likewise not long before the ship was brought to anchor, one of the seamen steering at the time endangered himself by letting the blacks remark some expression in his countenance, arising from a cause similar to the above, but this sailor, by his heedful after-conduct, escaped. That these statements are made to show the court that, from the beginning to the end of the revolt, it was impossible for the deponent and his men to act otherwise than they did. And the third clerk, Hermenegildo Gandix, who before had been forced to live among the seamen, wearing a seaman's habit, and in all respects appearing to be one for the time, he, Gandix, was killed by a musket ball fired through mistake from the boats before boarding, having in his fright run up the mizzen rigging, calling to the boats, don't board, lest upon their boarding the negro should kill him that this inducing the Americans to believe he some way favoured the cause of the Negroes, they fired two balls at him, so that he fell wounded from the rigging and was drowned in the sea, that the young Don Joaquin, Marcus de Aramwalaza, like Hermenegildo Gandix, the third clerk, was degraded to the office and appearance of a common seaman, that upon one occasion when Don Joaquin shrank, the Negro Babo commanded the Ashanti Lekbi to take tar and heat it and pour it upon Don Joaquin's hands, that Don Joaquin was killed owing to another mistake of the Americans, but one impossible to be avoided as upon the approach of the boats. Don Joaquin, with a hatchet tied their jout and upright to his hand, was made by the Negroes to appear on the bulwarks, whereupon seen with arms in his hands and is a questionable altitude, he was shot for a renegade seaman. That on the person of Don Joaquin was found secreted a jewel, which, by papers that were discovered, proved to have been meant for the shrine of Our Lady of Mercy in Lima. A votive offering beforehand prepared and guarded to attest his gratitude when he should have landed in Peru, his last designation for the safe conclusion of the entire voyage from Spain, that the jewel, with the other effects of the late Don Joaquin, is in the custody of the brethren of the hospital 
awaiting the disposition of the Honourable Court, that owing to the condition of the deponent, as well as the haste in which the boats departed for the attack, the Americans were not forewarned that there were among the apparent crew a passenger and one of the clerks disguised by the Negro Babu. Beside the Negroes killed in the action, some were killed after the capture and re-anchoring at night when shackled to the ring bolts on deck, and these deaths were committed by the sailors ere they could be prevented. That so soon as informed of it, Captain Amasa Delano used all his authority, and in particular with his own hand, struck down Martinez Gola, who, having found a razor in the pocket of an old jacket of his, which one of the shackled Negroes had on, was aiming it at the Negro's throat, that the noble Captain Amasa Delano also wrenched from the hand of Bartholomew Barlow a dagger, secreted at the time of the massacre of the whites, with which he was in the act of stabbing a shackled Negro, who, the same day with another Negro, had thrown him down and jumped upon him, that, for all the events befalling through so long a time, during which the ship was in the hands of the Negro Babu, he cannot here give account, but that what he has said is the most substantial of what occurs to him at present, and is the truth under the oath which he has taken, which declaration he affirmed and ratified after hearing it read to him. He said that he is 29 years of age and broken in body and mind, and when finally dismissed by the court, he shall not return home to Chile, but betake himself to the monastery Mount Agonia without, and signed with his honour, and crossed himself, and for the time departed as he came in his litter with the monk Infeles to the hospital de Sacerdotes. If the deposition have served as the key to fit into the lock of the complications which precede it, then, as a vault whose door has been flung back, the San Dominic's hull lies open today. Hitherto the nature of this narrative, besides rendering the intricacies in the beginning unavoidable, has more or less required that many things, instead of being set down in the order of occurrence, should be retrospectively or irregularly given. This last is the case with the following passages, which will conclude the account. During the long, mild voyage to Lima, there was, as before hinted, a period during which the sufferer a little recovered his health, or at least in some degree his tranquillity. Ere the decided relapse which came, the two captains had many cordial conversations, their fraternal unreserve, in singular contrast with former withdrawments. Again and again it was repeated, how hard it had been to enact the part forced on the Spaniard by Babu. Ah, my dear friend, Don Benito once said, at whose very times, when you thought me so morose and ungrateful, nay, when you, as you now admit, you half thought me plotting your murder, at those very times my heart was frozen. I could not look at you, thinking of what, both on board this ship and your own, hung from other hands over my kind benefactor. And as God lives, Don Amasa, I know not whether desire for my own safety alone could have nerved me to that leap into your boat, had it not been for the thought that, did you, unenlightened, return to your ship, you, my best friend, with all who might be with you, stolen upon that night, in your hammocks, would never in this world have awakened again. Do but think how you walked this deck, how you sat in this cabin, every inch of ground mined into honeycombs under you. Had I dropped the least hint, made the least advance towards an understanding between us, death, explosive death, yours as mine, would have ended the scene. True, true, cried Captain Delano, starting. You have saved my life, Don Benito, more than I yours. Saved it too, against my knowledge and will. Nay, my friend, rejoined the Spaniard, courteous even to the point of religion. God charmed your life, but you saved mine. 
to think of some things you did, those smallings and chattings, rash pointings and gesturings. For less than these, they slew my mate, Ranids. But you had the Prince of Heaven's safe conduct through all ambuscades. Yes, all is owing to providence, I know, but the temper of my mind that morning was more than commonly pleasant, while the sight of so much suffering, more apparent than real, added to my good nature, compassion and charity, happily interweaving the three. Had it been otherwise, doubtless as you hint, some of my interference might have ended unhappily enough. Besides, those feelings I spoke of enabled me to get the better of momentary distrust at times when acuteness might have cost me my life without saving another's. Only at the end did my suspicions get the better of me, and you know how wide off the mark they then proved. Wide indeed, said Don Benito, sadly. You were with me all day, stood with me, sat with me, talked with me, looked at me, ate with me, drank with me, and yet your last act was to clutch for a monster, not only an innocent man, but the most pitiable of all men. To such degree may malign machinations and deceptions impose. Far may even the best man err in judging the conduct of one with the recesses of whose condition he is not acquainted. But you were forced to it, and you were in time undeceived. You generalised on Benito, and mournfully enough, but the past is past, why moralise upon it? Forget it. See yon bright sun has forgotten it all, and the blue sea and the blue sky, these have turned over new leaves. Because they have no memory, he dejectedly replied, because they are not human. But these mild trades that now fan your cheek, do they not come with a human-like healing to you? Warm friends, steadfast friends are the trades. With their steadfastness, they but waft me to my tomb, signor, was the foreboding response. You are saved, cried Captain Delano, more and more astonished and pained. You are saved. What has cast such a shadow upon you? The Negro. There was a silence. While the moody man sat, slowly and unconsciously gathering his mantle about him, as if it were a pal. There was no more conversation that day. But if the Spaniard's melancholy sometimes ended in muteness upon topics like the above, There were others upon which he never spoke at all, on which, indeed, all his old reserves were piled. Pass over the worst, and only to elucidate, let an item or two of these be cited. The dress, so precise and costly, worn by him on the day whose events have been narrated, had not willingly been put on. And that silver-mounted sword, apparent symbol of despotic command, was not indeed a sword but the ghost of one. The scabbard, artificially stiffened, was empty. As for the black whose brain, not body, had schemed and led the revolt, with the plot, his slight frame, inadequate to that which it held, had at once yielded to the superior muscular strength of his captor in the boat. Seeing all was over, he uttered no sound and could not be forced to, His aspect seemed to say, Since I cannot do deeds, I will not speak words. Put an irons in the hold, with the rest. He was carried to Lima. During the passage, Don Benito did not visit him, nor then, nor at any time after, would he look at him. Before the tribunal, he refused. When pressed by the judges, he fainted. On the testimony of the sailors alone, rested the legal identity of Babo, some months after, dragged to the gibbet at the tail of a mule. The black met his voiceless end. The body was burned to ashes, but for many days, the head, that hive of subtlety, fixed on a pole in the plaza, met unabashed the gaze of the whites, and across the plaza looked toward St. Bartholomew's church, in whose vaults slept then, as now, the recovered bones of Aranda, and across the Rimac Bridge 
look towards the monastery on Mount Agonia, where, three months after being dismissed by the court, Benito Serino, born on the beer, did indeed follow his leader. The Lightning Rod Man what grand irregular thunder, thought I, standing on my hearthstone among the Croceronian hills, as the scattered bolts boomed overhead and crashed down among the valleys, every bolt followed by zigzag irradiations and swift slants of sharp rain, which audibly rang like a charge of spear points on my low shingled roof. I suppose, though, that the mountains hereabouts break and churn up the thunder, so that it is far more glorious here than on the plain. Hark, someone at the door. Who is this that chooses a time of thunder for making calls? And why don't he, man fashion, use the knocker, instead of making that doleful undertaker's clatter with his fist against the hollow panel? But let him in. Ah, here he comes. Good day, sir. An entire stranger. Pray be seated. What is that strange-looking walking stick he carries? A fine thunderstorm, sir. Fine? Awful. You are wet. Stand here on the hearth before the fire. Not for worlds. The stranger stood still in the exact middle of the cottage, where he had first planted himself. His singularity impelled a closer scrutiny, a lean, gloomy figure, hair dark and lank, mattedly streaked over his brow. His sunken pitfalls of eyes were ringed by indigo halos and played with an innocuous sort of lightning, the gleam without the bolt. The man was dripping. He stood in a puddle on the bare oak floor, his strange walking stick vertically resting at his side. It was a polished copper rod, four feet long, lengthwise attached to a neat wooden staff by insertion into two balls of greenish glass ringed with copper bands. The metal rod terminated at the top tripod-wise in three keen tines, brightly gilt. He held the thing by the wooden part alone. Sir, said I, bowing politely, have I the honour of a visit from that illustrious god Jupiter Tonans? So stood he in the Greek statue of old, grasping the lightning bolt. 